Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Tracy Mendez. I'm the executive director at CSHA, and I'm really excited to welcome you to this workshop. We have a great panel presenting for you this morning, and we're all excited to help you learn and think about strategies you can use to help ensure that you can financially support behavioral health services for children and adolescents in your school-based health centers. It's a really important topic right now. This workshop is focused on federally qualified health centers, which we call FQHCs or FQHC lookalikes. And I am suspecting there are others in the room today that don't come from an FQHC setting. Um, so you may find this, this workshop is not as relevant to you and um, we apologize for that. We hope you'll find some, something worthwhile and also want to offer that if you have um, questions that aren't met today, or suggestions for future trainings or workshops for your setting, uh, please let us know through the chat or other, um, any other way and we'll try to accommodate that at future um, sessions. So today we are very fortunate to have partners at the state level, including CSHA and the California Primary Care Association, um, and also the Oakland-based Native American Health Center. I want to thank our speakers for the last minute lineup changes and especially to Emily Shipman and Jessica Dyer for their game day pinch hitting. So <clears throat> some of you probably already know that school mental health is a really complicated field and funding for it is especially challenging. We have a lot to cover this morning, so our plan is to take one or two questions after each presenter for any of those really burning topics, and then at the end, we hope we'll have time for more questions. So I don't think we'll spend a lot of time framing the problem this morning because all of you know this, and that's why you're here, and that's why you're in this field. But um, suffice it to say that we are in an acute children's mental health crisis right now. And even before COVID, only 30 per 35% of the youth who reported needing mental health services actually received them. And most of those students, most of those young people who received services did so through their schools, either through school mental health personnel or the school-based health center. And then we've got this perfect storm, right? With COVID and the heightened social, economic, uh, health, uh, and racial inequalities that that has brought, both through the disease and through the subsequent lockdown and not to mention our country's centuries of institutional racism actively continuing to this day. So for example, some new data show that one in four young adults have seriously considered suicide in the past year, and this, this rate continues to be about 40% for LGBTQ uh, adolescents and youth. Rates of anxiety and depression have more than tripled since the start of the pandemic. Calls to suicide hotlines are way up intimate partner violence is increasing, and many of these trends are more pronounced among Black youth and other children of color. <clears throat> so how do services, these critical services, get paid for? Um, historically, two of the most common sources of funding for school mental health services overall have been EPSDT and ERMS, E-R-M-H-S. Allie from CPCA is going to talk a little bit about EPSDT in a few moments, but I just wanted to share a little bit of information about ERMS um, because I think it's helpful for those of us in the health and mental health side of things to understand the education environment um, that we're operating in. So <clears throat> ERMS stands for Educationally Related Mental Health Services. This is an education funded service um, and it's not a Medi-Cal program. So a lot of us in healthcare tend to think of Medi-Cal as kind of the go-to funding source for a lot of services, especially for low-income children. Um, ERMS is off, sometimes been called AB 114 or AB 3632 in California because of past legislation. Um, and it's a program required by the Federal Department of Education for all local school districts for students in special education who have an IEP or IFSP, and if, if there's questions about these terminologies, you can chat them to us, um, and who have a behavioral health need that impacts their learning, so something like an ADHD or an anxiety disorder. The funding comes from federal and state education dollars carved out specifically for mental health services, 
And just to get really technical for a moment, that money flows through th something called SELPAs that are often associated with county offices of education. Um, those services can then be provided directly by local educational agencies like school districts, or often they're provided through contracts with community-based mental health organizations that place therapists on school sites. So just wanted to share some of that as background. That's not what we'll be focused on today. And in fact, there are many, many other potential funding streams and sources for child, children and school mental health. And just some of those are shown in this picture. In fact, mental health financing for children and youth is really a very complicated set of separate programs. Some run through healthcare, some through mental health, and others through education or social services. Some of them are based on family and student income, and some aren't. And each one has its own set of eligibility, service coverage, rules, contracting, rates, and provider networks. And yet, as you probably know, we still find ourselves struggling to pay for clinician time, especially time spent providing certain types of services like prevention. Uh, the best administrators in school-based mental health will blend and braid many of these funding, much of this funding together, which can be hard. So today we're going to focus mostly on two Medi-Cal funding streams that are accessible for many school-aged children and youth um, and that most FQHCs should be able to access for their populations. These are both a really good fit with the integrated school-based health model and they're shown here. If you're already providing behavioral health services in a school-based health center, you probably know how hard it is. You know that it's not enough to set up a school-based health center and offer behavioral health services and expect that you'll be able to recoup the costs of your clinician time, much less all the management and support staff um, for all the reasons listed here that we won't uh, go into detail right now. In many ways, in many ways, the reason um, this is so difficult is because the school-based health center delivery model is really set up to expand access and to welcome in people, young people at an early stage in their difficulties, whereas our financing systems for mental health are much more established to um, sort of keep people out in their, until they're more acute and to manage care and what, what we call gatekeep. So that's a fundamental um, dilemma. But it is possible to create a great set of services and mental health interventions. And that's what Katie and Jessica will be bringing us today. Some tips and tricks for viable programs and paths for your behavioral health services using these two medical health uh, funding streams. So without further ado, I would like to introduce two brilliant and fabulous colleagues from the California Primary Care Association. If you don't know CPCA, please look them up and familiarize yourselves with their, uh, all their resources. They're at least 20 times bigger than CSHA and they have a ton of resources for community clinics. I'm gonna turn it over to Ali Boudens. Ali. And I'm stopping my share. As soon as I can Great. get Great. Thanks so much for that background and introduction, Tracy. Really appreciate it. So my colleague, um, Emily Shipman, is going to get set up with the slides here. And we'll just give a moment for that transition. Um, but we're really excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much for having us. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the behavioral health delivery system in California, how it's structured. And then we'll dive into the really important role that health centers play um, as providers in this care continuum and how they work to ensure access and quality to integrated physical, behavioral, and social determinants of health. And we're really pleased to kick off this morning. Great, so uh, again, my name is Ali Budenz. I'm the Assistant Director of Quality Improvement at the California Primary Care Association. I'm joined by my colleague, Emily Shipman, who's the Associate Director of Health Center Operations. And you have our email addresses on the slide there in case you need to reach out with any questions um, post presentation. We're always happy to hear from you. Great, so let's preview a little bit of our section for this morning's content. Um, we're gonna start with a really high level 30,000 foot overview of California's behavioral health care continuum for Medi-Cal beneficiaries. And in that section, we'll talk about some of the challenges that, th that this system poses um, to beneficiaries needing care, and certainly some of the challenges that providers navigate in trying to offer these integrated services. And then we'll preview a little bit about what's on the horizon in terms of policy changes to support a more integrated environment. 
And finally, we'll dive deeper into the micro level of what an FQHC actually is and the work they do within the mild to moderate behavioral health system. Next slide. Great, and so just a, a couple minutes about CPCA and the health center members that we represent. If you're not familiar with the California Primary Care Association, we are the statewide association that represents community clinics and health centers. We provide advocacy, training, and technical assistance on a number of different issue areas that support health centers to be the most effective and the most efficient at serving the health needs of their communities, which absolutely includes behavioral health and the social determinants of health. We have a varied membership. Oh, you can go back really quick. I just wanted to call out a couple of our different member types. Um, so we have a varied membership. They're all listed right there on the right. Um, and they're community health centers of one variation or another. And we'll get into a little bit of the nuances of the different types of health centers. Um, and we also are very pleased to have our partner regional associations of California um, as members of CPCA too. I wanted to call them out specifically in this space because given California's size and complexity, we have a really special structure that relies on the regional consortia to work with CPCA at the local level. Sometimes that's one county, sometimes it's a combination of counties. Um, and what the RAC do is really offer that uh, localized advocacy training and technical assistance, which is really important because as you know, the behavioral health delivery system is extremely localized. It's really dependent on the resources and the structure of your county. And so the RAC with their hyper-local focus are really critical partners in this space. Now you can go to the next slide. Great, so let's dive into the behavioral health delivery system in California. Everybody take a deep breath, ready? Okay, because <laughs> um, it's a little bit complicated, right? So I just want to call out that this slide is from the California Healthcare Foundation, who's been pouring a lot of thought, a lot of um, action and resources into the case for behavioral health integration um, recently. And just by this visual, you can see that uh, Medi-Cal, so California's public insurance product, has a divided behavioral health system. It's trifurcated really, and let's get into those three different parts. So on the one hand, you have Medi-Cal managed care plans administering the physical health and the mild to moderate mental health services within their network of contracted providers, of which FQHCs are a huge part of this network. Then you have county specialty mental health plans administering the specialty mental health benefit for people, people with serious mental illness. And finally, you have about 95% of Medi-Cal beneficiaries with substance use disorder receiving substance use disorder services through county administered drug Medi-Cal organized delivery systems, often referred to as ODS systems. And I just wanna say before we move on that prior to coming to CPCA, I used to actually work in a, in a health center in Sacramento. And I can tell you, as I'm sure you already know, this system is incredibly hard to navigate from an administrative, a financial, an operational perspective. There are so many provider networks, so many different payers, and providers often don't really know what's happening in different parts of the system. And remember, at the center of this system is supposed to be the patient. But right now, we're pairing the most vulnerable and at-risk patients with the most complex system. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about what we hope to see change um, to make the system a little bit easier and more, um, user-friendly and effective. Okay, next slide. Um, so we just previewed the trifurcated system, and now I wanna talk a little bit more about how FQHCs as providers live within this model. So the graphic on the right-hand side is from CPCA's Leveraging FQHCs in the Behavioral Health Care Continuum Report, um, and we published this in 2018. It's still on our website if you would like to go take a look at it. Um, it also has a lot of really good background about the trifurcated system, so I highly recommend this report. Um, and so what this graphic shows is how an FQHC scope of service may overlap with mild to moderate, severe, and specialty mental health services. Just because a different part of the system technically administers a program doesn't mean that the health center doesn't offer those services within their scope of service. There may be many different reasons why a patient chooses to receive their specialty mental health or their substance use disorder services within their FQHC health home. Maybe they trust their care team, they've been established with the health center for a long time, or they can't access the county behavioral health services. Maybe the FQHC is closer to their home or it's on their direct bus route. Many different reasons. All of that said, 
the bulk of FQHC behavioral health services are considered mild to moderate. Um, and I use air quotations because mild to moderate in and of itself uh, is a little bit difficult to define. And a person can sort of weave in and out for all the clinicians in the room. You know, you can sort of weave in and out between being well managed um, and, and, and different parts of, of uh, your, yeah, your behavioral health uh, diagnosis. So again, the bulk of behavioral health services are considered mild to moderate. Um, and health centers, like I said, are primary, are one of the primary contracted providers for Medi-Cal managed care plans. Um, and over the years, they've built up a ton of clinical capacity and expertise in this space. Um, so much so that about 85% of health centers are at least co-located or fully integrated um, with behavioral health on their primary care teams which means that a behavioral health provider and a primary care provider are both equally involved in diagnosing and treating the patients in the primary care setting, which is really true integration. Some health centers also have contracts with their um, county specialty mental health plans or their county drug medical organized delivery systems to participate as providers, contracted pri providers within those systems. And it's important to know that FQHCs have a really important and unique role in the delivery system because they innately offer an integrated care model. A person can come in for a, a diabetes exam and because the primary care team screens for depression and screens for toxic stress, the patient you know, could have a brief interview to address their acute needs with the behavioral health provider in primary care. And then they can leave um, with an appointment with an LCSW for a more thorough assessment and some sort of regular treatment, behavioral health therapy, um, starting later in the week, for example. And my colleague Emily is going to touch a little bit more on the billing guidance that health centers live under. But I did want to say that it's, it's tricky and it's not always conducive to an integrated environment. Um, the biggest challenge that health centers face is that they aren't paid for primary care and behavioral health visits that happen in the same day. Um, even if they're two distinct and unique visits, you can only bill for one of those visits, primary care or behavioral health in a single day. Um, additionally, health centers are really hamstrung by certain provider types being billable and all P PPS um, services and PPS is the way that health centers get paid. All PPS services have to be within the four walls of the health center. And there's been some exceptions made for the public health emergency that allow for telehealth environments, um, but generally everything has to be within the four walls. Next slide. Okay, so um, that was a lot of information. Now we're gonna move into a little bit of the policy environment. And I realize um, that this is probably eliciting a little bit of tiny font fear. Um, but don't worry because you don't need to know all of this information. Uh, what I really wanted to get across to you right now is that, is this title, right? Integration is inevitable. Providers have known it for years that an integrated environment leads to better care outcomes. Um, and based on everything, all the signals that we're getting from the state and from the administration, they're starting to come around to this idea too, um, which is very exciting. And so the four columns here represent programs and different funding opportunities that the state has prioritized starting in 2019 and moving forward um, indefinitely. And the common thread among all of these is that state agencies, managed care plans and providers are all engaged in efforts to address comprehensive medical, behavioral, and social needs within an integrated delivery platform in pursuit of the whole person care. Prior to COVID, um, the state started an initiative that would fundamentally redesign Medi-Cal in support of a more coordinated, integrated, and standardized care. This was called the CalAIM initiative, California Advancing and Innovative Medi-Cal, in case you want to look it up. Um, it's a pretty long document with a lot of proposals, um, but you can find it on the DHCS website if you're interested. What's the most important that I really want to call out in the CalAIM is that it's not necessarily the content, which I think is really interesting um, and, and has a lot of imp implications, but rather just the concept that the state is willing to redline the status quo and re-envision Medi-Cal designed around integration. That's huge. It hasn't been done before um, in California and, and it's a really great opportunity. And the other big final takeaway from this slide is that the state could have very easily cut any of these programs um, in face of the billions of dollars of deficit that we're seeing um, due to the economic crisis from the pandemic. 
but instead they're still investing, you know, a hundred million dollars in the value-based behavioral health integration pilots, which are going to test some integrated care model models largely within FQHCs. Um, and, and that's huge. That really shouldn't be ignored. And uh, just so you all know, I, I, this, I see the, in the comments that the slides blur blurry, totally understand. It's really tiny font. Um, and these slides will be available if you need to see them later, you can blow them up, no problem. Okay, um, so great. We talked a little bit about the behavioral health um, care continuum. We talked about how FQHCs work in that. We talked a little bit about the policy. Let's take a step back and just review what an FQHC is and where they come from. Um, I'm always really proud and love to talk about FQHCs because I really believe in this model. Um, so I wanted to talk about the origin stories of FQHCs. And I don't know about you all, but um, in this uh, safer at home environment, I've been spending a lot of time with my four-year-old who is really into superheroes. And so I am learning so much about the origin stories of all of these great superheroes. I know more about Spider-Man and Iron Man than you would care to know. Um, and I was like, yes, every great superhero has an origin story. So let's talk about the FQHC origin story. Um, FQHCs originate in the merging of the civil rights and the social justice movements of the 1960s when community organizers saw that poorer communities had adverse health outcomes due to poor access. And so physician leaders, Drs. Jack Geiger and Count D. Gibson Jr. pioneered a South African model of care in which you bring care to the people. Novel idea, right? Show up where the people need you. And so in 1965, the first neighborhood health centers were established in Dorchester, Massachusetts, Mount Bayou, Mississippi, and Denver, Colorado. And then 10 years later in 1975, the community health center program was authorized for the first time as a permanent program within section 330 of the US Public Health Services Act. And from that, we have the distinction federally qualified health center or FQHC. Next slide. And so diving a little bit more into what an FQHC is and what their scope of service is, um, the FQHC is, like I said, the distinction authorized in statute that acknowledges that a clinic serves a specific population that is either um, an underserved population or in a medically underserved area. Excuse me, and they do this either through direct services or through contract agreements. So FQHCs also receive a yearly grant from the Health Resource Services Administration that supports some of the uncompensated care um, that they provide. There are also a couple of other distinctions that I wanted to touch upon, like the FQHC lookalike. And FQHC lookalikes do also meet all of the Section 330 requirements, but they don't receive the federal funding under the Section 330 grant. And I didn't wanna um, exclude either some of the important categories of health centers or clinics that aren't FQHCs, like rural health centers, urban Indian and tribal clinics and free clinics. Um, in California alone, there are over 1300 licensed community health centers in the state. The majority of those are federally qualified health centers. And so that sort of wraps it up for my piece. I'm gonna hand things over to my colleague, Emily Shipman, who's gonna talk a little bit more about um, establishing school-based health center sites and uh, dive deeper into the mild to moderate space of um, how FQHCs sort of the requirements that they have in mild to moderate behavioral health. Yep, thanks Ali. Hi everyone, I'm Emily Shipman, also with CPCA. I'm an associate director on CPCA's health center operations team. Um, and I'm very happy to be here with you virtually today um, and as Ali mentioned, I'll be presenting on sort of the nuts and bolts of how to actually uh, operationalize, excuse me, operationalize a new clinic site specifically um, at a school. So we know many health centers are responding to the needs of their communities by bringing healthcare services into communities, um, excuse me, into community-based sites such as schools. There are several important factors though that FQHCs specifically need to consider um, when expanding services into school sites. So we're going to look at those. That's HRSA scope, excuse me, HRSA scope of project, licensing requirements, um, enrolling the location into Medi-Cal, and setting a PPS rate. So before we talk about actually billing uh, at a school-based health center, let's touch on each of these critical steps. 
So not HRSA scoop, but HRSA scope of project approval. Um, so anytime a health center adds a new service or a new location, they must apply to HRSA for a change in scope of project uh, in order to have the new location and or services included in their existing scope. So the approval is important um, because the health center's scope identifies the services, the sites that are eligible for PPS reimbursement, uh, extends FTCA medical malpractice insurance for health centers and employees, and provides the site information which enables health centers to purchase discounted drugs under the 340B program, um, and defines the approved sites for DHCS to calculate reimbursement rates under PPS um, and Medicare to do that on the federal side. So, scope changes are requested via EHB, so that's electronic handbook submission, and should be requested at least 60 days prior to the intended change. That gives time for HRSA to review and ask for any additional information needed to approve that change. And HRSA does have a number of resources available on their scope change webpage. If you're not familiar with the process, um, that'll help you walk through. So I went ahead and included those on the slide. Okay, so licensing. Um, I don't know how many uh, watching the webinar are familiar with licensing a primary care clinic in California, but um, as Ali did earlier, it might be time for collective deep breath. Um, licensing can be a complicated, it can be a drawn out process. It doesn't necessarily have to be, um, but let's talk a little bit about what the requirements are. So FQHCs can provide care to patients at school sites that are designated as either a licensed clinic, um, an intermittent clinic, or a mobile unit that is also designated as a licensed or an intermittent clinic. Licensing is done through the California Department of Public Health's Licensing and Certification Division. So to apply for a license, health centers apply through the Centralized Applications Branch, or CAB, sometimes called CAB, of licensing and certification. And the licensing process can vary greatly in terms of processing time. So a good rule of thumb, if you can swing it, uh, is to submit at least a few months in advance of your intended start or open date. Um, and that ensures time for application review by the state and a site survey if it's needed for your particular type of license. So clinics must meet requirements that are verified through this application process, um, as well as through subsequent site surveys by CDPH. So that's licensed clinics. Intermittent clinics um, are a little different from licensed locations. Uh, in that they must be operated by an existing licensed, what we call parent location, um, and intermittent clinics are only eligible to operate up to 40 hours per week, um, but they're exempt from licensure requirements. So they have to meet fire and life safety, but all the whole host of um, chapter of health and safety code that applies to licensed clinics um, does not apply to intermittent clinics as they're operated by uh, this parent clinic. I will add too that there is an existing uh, all facilities letter um, that went out to all licensed um, clinics or should have been received. If you're a licensed clinic and you didn't see it, um, please contact me, I'm happy to share that. But what it does is it waives a number of, of clinic licensing requirements due to the ongoing state of emergency in California due to COVID-19. So um, some of those requirements would impact opening a new clinic or an intermittent clinic. So um, if you're thinking about doing that or you are doing that, you should be aware the all facilities letter does waive um, the requirement that licensed sites actually wait for the licensing approval before they begin operating. So as soon as you submit your, um, your completed licensing application to CAB, and because of this AFL that waives the requirements, you can go ahead and begin operating while CAB works on reviewing that application. Um, the same is true for intermittent sites and also the 40 hour per week uh, maximum for intermittents is currently waived due to that AFL, um, and I think it's through, I believe, end of March um, at this point. It has been extended once already, so good thing to keep in mind. Okay, so Medi-Cal enrollment and PPS rate setting. Um, licensed clinics not only receive their licenses through CDPH, but their Medi-Cal enrollment application process begins with CAB or the Centralized Applications Branch as well. So simultaneously with the licensing application, clinics who are wishing to enroll in Medi-Cal also submit their certification or enrollment documentation. So CAB processes the license and then they pass the certification or enrollment documentation along to Medi-Cal. 
um, Medi-Cal ultimately ensures that the new location is uploaded into their system and enrolled as a Medi-Cal provider. Um, and then they send the welcome to Medi-Cal letter, um, which says, you know, hello, here's the MPI you're enrolled under, go ahead and start submitting claims. So FQHCs must also go through the rate setting process for their new location. So licensed locations set their PPS rate either utilizing a cost report method or by selecting three comparable clinics whose rates are averaged. Um, my understanding is that that's significantly harder to do um, with a school-based clinic, um, you know, given the amount of, of comparable clinics you might find non-school-based versus school-based. Um, however, I believe that's still an option. I don't know if folks are able to actually utilize it. Um, intermittent mobile locations are a little different. They're not eligible for their own PPS rates. Um, so they're assigned the PPS rate of a parent location, and that's determined by the FQHC. So at this point, um, DHCS, the state, there are no specific requirements around um, the parent location that an FQHC chooses. Um, they have, they being DHCS, has indicated um, that they would like there to be some parameters there. So um, the general guidance we give folks is that when choosing a parent site for your intermittent um, you should choose a site that um, is similar in proximity and in patient mix and services offered. So, um, so geographically nearby, um, you know, it doesn't really make sense to choose a, a clinic much further away if you have closer clinics. Um, and anyway, as for now, there aren't those requirements in place, but good thing to consider if you're um, looking at opening up the site as an intermittent clinic. So, and if you're shaking your head and saying, hey lady, we have a mobile unit, it does have its own PPS rate. Um, yes, in the past that was, um, that was a practice that the state allowed. So mobile units were able to set their own PPS rate based on the services being provided, um, but that's no longer the case. Um, so some mobile units will still have grandfathered in that old PPS rate, um, but new mobile units don't have that option. Um, and a resource on this slide here is the website from CAB that has licensure forms and guidance. They have checklists um, to help walk you through that process. Okay, so getting into actually billing and what reimbursement looks like for FQHCs and Medi-Cal. So being able to obtain reimbursement from payers is vital to a health center's ability to keep their doors open, continue providing uh, high quality affordable care. I'm sure we're all on the same page there. Um, but to that end, it really is to the benefit of the health center to fully understand the billing and reimbursement policies for each of their payers. Um, as noted here, we're only going to be covering Medi-Cal billing and reimbursement today. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I just saw a chat question around PPS. So what does PPS stand for? PPS stands for a prospective payment system, and it refers to the way that FQHCs get paid in a single payment um, that is meant to include all of the costs for providing their services. So as I was mentioning, um, we're only going to get into Medi-Cal billing and reimbursement today. Sorry, just making sure I'm catching the chat questions as I go. Don't want you guys scratching your heads about what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so for FQHCs to bill Medi-Cal, the visit must be a face-to-face -face encounter between a Medi-Cal beneficiary and a billable provider in which the provider is rendering medically necessary services. So FQHCs can bill for behavioral health services that are provided by licensed psychologists, licensed clinical social workers, or marriage and family therapists. Um, so of no, health centers must submit a PPS change in scope of services request so if you're not familiar, a change in scope of services request is how you augment or change your PPS rate based on a change in providers or services at your health centers. Um, so if you do want to get reimbursed for services that are being provided by MFTs, you need to file a change in scope of services request um, in order to make those MFTs billable providers for your health center. Um, if an FQHC does submit a claim for MFTs, that will automatically trigger that requirement to submit a change in scope um, to DHCS. So that doesn't mean the first time that you submit a claim, DHCS is going to call you and say, hey, where's your change in scope? It just means that it's going to be on their radar and eventually you will need to file that change in scope. 
So as most of you already know, FQHCs are reimbursed at the PPS rate. Again, that's prospective payment system, and it's inclusive of all the services provided during a visit. So this means that encounters with more than one health professional or multiple encounters with the same health professional that take place on the same day at a single location constitute a single visit. And Ali touched a little bit on that, um, and it definitely makes things challenging um, in terms of integration. So while there are instances in which FQHCs can bill for more than one visit on the same day, Medi-Cal doesn't allow FQHCs to bill for medical and behavioral health visits on the same day, unfortunately. Additionally, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, give me just one moment, actually, if I could do a quick pause here. Sorry about that, guys. Perks of being live. So um, I was just going to get into talking about intermittent. So intermittent clinics bill Medi-Cal under the parent sites NPI for reimbursement at the parent sites PPS rate. So I did just talk a little bit about how both intermittents and mobiles um, aren't eligible for their own PPS rate. So that's that's why. Um, but this is just specific to Medi-Cal. So intermittents do need to separately enroll into Medi-Cal subprograms like Family Pact. Um, and they do need to separately enroll uh, into Medicare if um, you're a Medicare provider. So when a health center has a contract with a Medi-Cal managed care plan, the FQHC bills the health plan separately, um, and then they bill a wrap claim to the state. The wrap payment provides the difference between the health plan payment and what the FQHC's actual PPS rate is. So in that way, the FQHC is made whole. Um, it's common for managed care plans to subcontract with Beacon uh, to manage behavioral health services. In this case, you would follow the same billing process by submitting a claim to Beacon um, and then that wrap claim to the state. Each managed care plan has their own billing requirements. Um, so please check with your contracted plans for their specific information um, about how they want those claims submitted. So lastly, if a Medi-Cal managed care patient is seen out of network, uh, the FQHC can still bill the wrap claim to Medi-Cal for the visit. However, the FQHC must refer the patient back to their assigned provider um, for future visits. They have to document that referral in the patient's medical records um, and maintain proof of payment or denial from the managed care plan. Um, if the plan ultimately does deny the claim, the FQHC will be made hold of their full PPS rate during the annual reconciliation process that they go through with the HCS audits and investigations. Okay, so actually looking at some billing. Now that we better understand the billing and reimbursement policies, let's briefly discuss the billing code sets for FQHCs. So listed here are a few HIPAA compliant billing code sets. Um, please note this is not a comprehensive list. What you see on this slide is the billing code sets that are relevant to our discussion today, which is billing for behavioral health services in a school-based community clinic. Um, and I know we got some feedback earlier that slides were a little blurry. Um, so hopefully, um, if you can't see them right now, you'll be able to access them after the fact. So sorry about that. Um, so listed in row one is the billing code set for a visit with a patient enrolled in fee-for-service or straight Medi-Cal. And row two is the billing code set for the wrap claim for a patient enrolled in managed care. Okay, just getting a note that slides are okay, that's good. So for behavioral health services not covered by a patient's managed care plan, FQHCs bill using one of the billing code sets as seen in rows three through five. So those claims would go straight to Medi-Cal. Okay, so let's look, oops. Let's look at some actual examples of what a claim might look like. Um, what you see on this slide are two billing examples excuse me, um, for FQHCs. The first example is for a claim to Medi-Cal for a visit with a patient enrolled in straight fee-for-service Medi-Cal. Um, and for our purposes today, let's say this is a behavioral health visit. Um, as noted in this example, the claim is billed with revenue code 0521 and HCPCS code T1015. 
Now moving down to example two, this shows a wrap claim to Medi-Cal. Since the patient is enrolled in Medi-Cal managed care plan, the FQHC would also need to submit a claim to the managed care plan. So this would be just the portion that goes to Medi-Cal for the wrap. Okay, so that wraps up my portion talking about sort of the nuts and bolts for getting a site enrolled and doing um, the basic billing. Um, let's move into, I believe, space. I think we have space for a couple questions. So, okay, and I'm looking at the chat here. It looks like I think our best bet for folks is if you chat your questions in. Um, I don't know if folks have done that yet. Jessica, let me know if you see any questions come in through the chat. We'll hang out here for a minute before we move on to the next presentation. Yes, so I have um, one question that has come through. The claim indicated it would be for a service not covered by the managed care plan. Do you need to have any letter or, un or other information from the MCP? Okay, so the question is, if the, if the managed care plan is saying that they won't pay and so you want to bill Medi-Cal, what documentation do you need from the plan? Great question. Um, I don't know the answer offhand, but I can look into it and I can follow up after the webinar. Great, thank you. I, I think I know the answer, um, right. Emily. All you would need actually is just the denial from the managed care plan in order to bill um, the state for, to make yourself whole in the rep. Great, thank you. Um, and there is uh, one more question. Um, okay. There was mentioned that services need to be within the four walls, but is there exceptions with that with telehealth? Do you want me to take that one, Emily? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so typically um, services would need to be within the four walls of the health center for that site, right? Um, there have been exceptions made um, due to the public health emergency declaration that allows for telehealth services. Um, typically, outside of the public health emergency, the state would consider telehealth um, outside of the four walls. So we have that small allowance for right now, and we're doing our darndest to, to keep it indefinitely. Um, through a lot of advocacy at, at CPCA, our regional consortia, health centers themselves, and other stakeholders, um, there seems to be a broad coalition of support that we need to keep that access point. Um, but for right now, it's only for the public health emergency. Thank you. And another, another question. Um, are most school-based FQHC services provided through mobile units, intermittent clinics, or full licensed locations? I don't know the answer to that. I'm curious yeah. whether, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I would think maybe, I, I don't know if that's something that you, you guys have a, a pulse on at the Alliance or um, maybe folks on the line. Know. Yeah, I think my understanding is about two thirds of school-based services are all FQHC. Um, I don't think mobile units is the most common, but, and I believe most of them are in intermittent clinics. Um, but Tracy, if I'm wrong on that, you can correct me. No, that sounds right. And I am not aware of any behavioral health services being provided in mobile units in yeah. school-based connections. Yes, mostly dental. Got it. A lot of dental and some medical. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, and now we will uh, move on to Katie and me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Katie Lampy. I am part of Native American Health Center. I'm the program manager for our Skyline site, which is a school-based health center. Let me go ahead and share the screen. So today we're going to talk about Medi-Cal behavioral and mental health pairs. Um, so like I said, my name is Katie. Um, I'm the program manager for the Skyline site. Um, Jessica Dyer, LCSW, she's the behavioral health project director for CSHA. She's gonna talk about more of the um, provider side, the billing side of this. So for medical mental health, uh, behavioral health services, these are the common student insurances that we see at our health center. Um, Emily went into uh, most of them. 
So we see Medi-Cal, Managed Care. Under that, we have Full Scope, Alameda Alliance with, as they mentioned, Beacon as the payer. Uh, we have Anthem Blue Cross and Kaiser as a PCP, all under Managed Care. Then we see Kaiser as private insurance. We have scenarios where students come in with no insurance. And then we also have minor consent, Medi-Cal, mental health, which will be the focus of uh, Jessica's side of the presentation. So the mental health services enrollment scenarios by insurance. So a student has been referred to the health center or request behavioral health services. Once in the clinic, they're gonna fill out the registration forms and the program coordinator does an insurance assessment. Uh, typically, what can happen with this is that our paperwork asks for the insurance, but a lot of times our students don't know um, what their insurance is. They will, um, so the program coordinator will ask them questions. They'll say, hey, when you go to the doctor, do you go to Kaiser? Do you go to the clinic? Um, the program coordinator position is a very important position. They are the front person, the you know, the contact between the student and the rest of the health center. So the scenario for Medi-Cal, Full Scope, Alameda Alliance, and Anthem Blue Cross. These are our main major payers for our behavioral health, mental health services. So a student has Medi-Cal, Alameda Alliance, Anthem Blue Cross with a PCP other than Kaiser, or the student may come in with Medi-Cal Full Scope. So the first thing that we'll do is we will typically check to see that we have a parent consent on file. If we don't, then we send the patient home with a parent consent, they come back, and then we go ahead and schedule them with the behavioral health clinician for about a 60 minute intake appointment. So when we're dealing with Kaiser, either private or through Medi-Cal managed care, the program coordinator needs to assess the level of difficulty the student has getting to Kaiser for their appointment. Um, so with a low difficulty level, the program coordinator will offer resources to connect the student with Kaiser Mental Health. Um, so the students uh, may say that they can go to Kaiser, but the clinic is just more convenient. Um, the PC may let them know that Kaiser doesn't reimburse our health clinic. Uh, they may not say that, uh, that's just depending on their level of comfort, um, but that they're happy to um, provide resources. So that may look like giving the student the Kaiser mental health phone number. In some cases, the student will have an appointment with the program manager so that the student can call like in their office, sometimes um, students often just either don't get around to it or it's not that important. So um, connecting them with the program manager can help facilitate that connection. If the student has a high difficulty level getting to Kaiser, the program coordinator typically will make a 30 minute appointment with the behavioral health clinician to assess for minor consent mental health eligibility. If the student is eligible, we will use minor consent mental health as a payer. Great, that's a fantastic scenario. If the student is ineligible, we would enact a protocol for temporary services, which we will go over more of that later. So if a student comes in and has no insurance, uh, the student doesn't have any insurance, the PC will schedule a 30 minute appointment with the behavioral health clinician to assess for minor consent mental health eligibility. So if the student is eligible, again, we will, the PC will enroll the student in minor consent Medi-Cal with the mental health uh, box checked. If the student is ineligible, our PCs typically enroll the patient in Medi-Cal temporary insurance, also known as Gateway. And then they will need to schedule a well child check with the medical provider as well child check is necessary to enroll in temporary Medi-Cal and obtain parental consent. In that scenario, the gateway insurance, so according to CDHP, which is the Child Health and Disparity Prevention Program, states that if we're going to use this temporary insurance for our students, we must do a well child check 
and then schedule for other services such as behavioral health or dental or something like that. Um, so in this scenario, what we would do is we would give the student a one page application with a parent consent. They would take that home, bring it back. We'll schedule the well child check for one day. And then we have to schedule the behavioral health appointment on another day because as was mentioned, we cannot schedule mental health and medical on the same day. So here's a little bit about the more important pieces of the minor consent Medi-Cal mental health application process. Here we have our MC4026 form. And I do apologize, ours is a really used form. And so we, it's, this is the best we got right now. So once the student has been assessed by the behavioral health clinician to meet eligibility for the criteria for uh, minor consent mental health, the minor consent mental health application must be filled out at that time. If it hasn't already been filled out earlier in the school year. A lot of times our patients will come in for sensitive services. They'll sign up with uh, Medi-Cal minor consent. We will usually check box pregnancy and fam or family planning and also sexually transmitted diseases at the beginning. If they come in later and want mental health services and they're um, you know, assessed by the provider and they're deemed eligible, we will go ahead and check box five, outpatient mental health. This is extremely important. This is for billing. This is to let the county know that we have added a service. So what needs to accompany the MC4026 forms and application is the, uh, clinician, the clinician letter. Basically, so a behavioral health clinician fills out a template letter. Your clinic information will be here. The behavioral health uh, provider will fill out the student name, the date of birth. The case number will only be there if they have a previous uh, minor consent application. If they don't and you're doing this for the first time, don't worry about the case number. It's not as important. You can always go back and fill it out later. Then the clinician will fill out the rest of the information and make sure that the make sure to state that these services will continue treatment for up to one year. Then your clinic information will go there, they will sign and date, and it'll be all good. So the letter, like I said, must accompany the application and or all monthly MC26 forms. Again, if the application has been done already early in the school year, it is extremely important then to fill out and check box five on the succeeding MC4026 forms, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. This right here is a sample of the minor consent ID card, which indicates activation. This is important um, because this is important for updating the minor consent tracking sheet. If a student already has a minor consent or an active minor consent case, then the PCP will go ahead and check box five on the succeeding forms and attach the letter to each one. This right here is what you will receive from your liaison after she has activated all of the minor consent. So once the liaison, so this is the sort of the billing section or the change. This is not exactly the billing. This is the change in the EHR that our clinic does and that billing will need to do. So the liaison adds the mental health services to the county case. Once that has been activated, and usually you know that when they return the next month to pick up new applications or MC4026 forms, they will let you know at that time, yes, we processed it. Yes, we have went ahead and um, added it to the case. Then you're going to go ahead and alert your billing department of the change in status when it's activated. So what we do in our clinic is that we go ahead and we change the payer aid code. Right here, a typical minor consent sensitive service application will have a 7M right here in the payer aid code. And I do apologize for that pop up that keeps happening. Um, when the mental health gets added to the case, that payer code will go from 7M 
to 7p. The reason that this is so important is because if you put in claims, if the behavioral health clinician puts in claims for minor consent mental health, we will not be reimbursed unless that aid code has changed to indicate that we have added that service. So this is the minor consent Medi-Cal outpatient mental health checklist. So we're going to have the behavioral health clinician. They must assess eligibility. The program managers can't do it. Medic, the medical team can't do it. Um, they can suggest, they can um, confer with the behavioral health clinician and say, hey, I think this student might qualify for this. And in that case, we would make them a 30-minute assessment appointment and go from there. Then we will have the student fill out the application. And we will make sure to have to put mark all of the correct boxes on the MC4026 forms. These forms we're going to make monthly copies of for either the rest of the months in the school year or for the one calendar year. Because minor consent has is activated, the activation card shows that it's active for one year. However, in reality, it is only good month to month depending on the MC4026 forms that are turned in. So we'll have the MC4026 forms and then the letter filled out and signed by the clinician. We're gonna attach to, we're gonna attach the letter either to the new application or to the MC4026 forms. It is very, very important that once you have added this service that when the county liaison comes in and they usually come in about once a month they should be coming in uh, to your clinic once a month we have our liaison come two times a month because we process a lot of minor consent as we are high school and we deal a lot with teenagers <laughs> um, so when the county liaison comes in to pick up her information and all of the paperwork, we're going to say, hey, this student has a mental health option. And so they are aware when they go back to activate the case or resubmit activation for a following month that they make sure to change the case to include mental health services. When they come back the next month, as I said, then they should usually let you know that, yes, we've changed the case. Then at that point, you're going to go ahead and you're going to alert your billing department of the change. And then you're either going to change the EHR uh, payer code, aid code from 7M to 7P, or the billing department will go ahead and do that. This is where you're going to need a really secure relationship with your billing department so that we can make sure that we are able to bill for the services that we are providing in our health center. Then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna track all of our minor consent applications. Uh, I, can't stress, I can't stress this enough how important it is that you track all of your minor consent applications. Uh, this way you can, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had to go back and check and see you know, who, who's already active, who's pending, who needs a new application. So some things to remember about this process. Minor consent Medi-Cal mental health may be used once a sense by the health clinician and determined to meet eligibility requirements. Unfortunately, minors under the age of 12 may not use minor consent mental health. Again, stress this <laughs> immensely. Continuation of coverage and to make sure that you are being reimbursed for all your services is a monthly commitment. The PC needs to submit application and or the MC4026 forms with that letter on a monthly basis. Then you're gonna go ahead and track all your minor consent applications in a database. We use an Excel spreadsheet. Sometimes they're smart sheets. Um, whatever it is, it, um, it's a very important part of this whole process. Ultimately, if the student does not have any eligible insurance, please be sure to create a protocol for short-term care for students that do not qualify for minor consent, they have 
um, Kaiser and have high difficulty level, um, or they just don't qualify for the gateway because their household makes too much money, whatever the case may be. We'll go into the protocol um, a little bit more with Jessica, but just to give you a general idea, the protocol that we have at our health center is that we are able to see patients one to four sessions um, for non-reimbursement. Uh, this is going to depend on how comfortable your uh, health center is with that. Um, they may, there may be grants like Emily uh, was talking about that will reimburse that at the end of the year. It just, it really depends. So the most that we can do typically is one to four. Um, we also refer those patients sometimes to um, our cost team or our coordination of services team because that team has a lot of other resources that the student might be able to utilize after they have used up their one to four services with us. So now I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen and turn it over to Jessica. And um, if you have any questions about this, we'll be happy to answer them after uh, her part of the presentation. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, and feel free to um, chat the questions in the chat box um, as they come up for you and we will get to them um, at the end. Uh, I am going to start my share. While you're doing that, Jessica, I just wanted to make sure that you share that even though you work at CSHA now, that your where your experience was working. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm just pulling up the uh, this on my screen as well. So, um, hi everyone. <laughs> yeah, so I currently am the behavioral health director at um, California School Based Health Alliance. Health Alliance. Um, and to, in this part of the presentation, and today I'm going to be um, talking um, a lot from my experience when I was the behavioral health um, provider at uh, Native American Health Center. Um, and I'm just checking that you all can see the uh, slide and not the presentation part. Great. Um, so thank you, Katie, for all the um, pieces about the uh, front of the house um, for minor consent. I'm gonna be talking about um, the perspective from the clinician side um, and starting out with um, what the clinician needs to be including for billing um, for all of the insurances. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about everything that the clinician needs to include in their assessments and um, each clinic is going to have their own policies and procedures that dictate some of those things. EHRs uh, do a really great job of helping to make sure clinicians are documenting all the details such as when the session begins and session ends, um, but I'm going to talk um, more about uh, what we need to document as far as the um, diagnosis, how to demonstrate um, medical necessity, how the diagnosis impacts um, clients' daily functioning and the diagnostic formulation, um, and then what needs to be included in the treatment plan. Um, so more of the storytelling side of uh, the clinician's piece, uh, what they need to show to demonstrate that this, what the need is for the child and how to best meet the need. Um, and so uh, to, to start, um, the clinician needs to um, be able to demonstrate that the client does have a DSM-5 um, diagnosis. And um, as Ali mentioned in her um, presentation, integration is really important and really helpful. And so when there are integrated behavioral health clinics and EHRs, um, those are really using the uh, ICD-10 code and the medical code. So there needs to be a DSM-5 diagnosis, and then the related ICD-10 code is what needs to be used in the EHR. Um, and so I just have a little chart here that shows what um, category the F codes 
the ICD-10 F codes are. And so for example, um, for a single episode of major depression disorder, um, that F code um, is 32.9. Um, so you can see mood disorders are gonna be in F30 to 39. Um, there are many crosswalks can Google between DSM-5 and ICD-10 to help you get the right code. A lot of EHRs themselves have them built in, which is really nice. Um, so it's not usually too hard to find, um, but it's just important that um, we use the correct ICD-10 codes. And ICD-10 codes are uh, more specific than DSM codes, so they've got a percentage or decimal points that you go out to get more and more specific around what um, a student is experiencing and it's really important that if there is more than one diagnosis that the student um, or client is experiencing that you include all of what they are experiencing so sometimes uh, it can happen where some a clinician will only put one diagnosis um, but that doesn't tell the whole story and for reimbursement and for payers they want to know what are they actually um, Funding. And so it's really important that um, as clinicians, we are documenting all of what a person is experiencing. Um, and whatever the focus is or is most uh, salient for that client at the time will be the top diagnosis. Um, but say they've got depression and anxiety or PTSD and um, depression, you want to make sure that you're um, listing out both of those. Or say there's a substance um, use problem, you want to also make sure that that um, is included and that um, whatever is at the, the first one you list is what you're really um, focusing on in that treatment, but th that the whole story is being told uh, for um, the payers and to be able to know what's actually going on. Um, and so then that brings me to um, not only is it important to document um, what the um, student is experiencing as far as what their what diagnosis they qualify for but also it's important to document medical necessity med and um, sometimes this can feel um, like it puts up barriers to treatment um, and there are actually right now many advocates working on removing this as a necessary criteria for um, school-based health services um, and having some other criteria um, such as an ACEs score or um, some social determinants um, of health to be criteria. And um, I think it's also important to understand that an intention of medical necessity is to actually protect the student and the client and to make sure that um, clients aren't receiving services that are more intention intensive than what is actually um, needed. So for example, not keeping a uh, client in inpatient treatment when really what they're going to be benefiting from is outpatient one-on-one um, -on -one individual services. It's, and so the idea and part of why it's important is that it really is to protect um, students and clients. And I think um, in school-based services, one way that it's helpful to think about this is that it can be helpful in uh, thinking about triaging the limited services. We all know that behavioral health services are so needed in schools and a lot of times very hard to find and there just are not enough clinicians and there aren't enough services. And so um, using the medical necessity criteria can help uh, to triage. So for example, if a student is experiencing some mild anxiety um, or stress symptoms, but overall, they're really functioning very well. They're still able to make it to class and do their homework. And um, socially, they have some friends they feel comfortable with. Um, what they may really benefit from is uh, a, like a, a group uh, setting where there's a stress management group uh, or a beginning high school managing anxiety group um, or some of those dynamic uh, mindfulness um, breathing groups. But they don't necessarily need... Uh, individual therapy services where they're meeting with the clinician one-on-one -on -one for an hour every week. Um, so looking at the medical necessity criteria, uh, the things that are important to remember are that uh, there is a DSM diagnosis and that the symptoms the um, person is experiencing are consistent with that and that you're documenting that. 
that you're documenting the uh, moderate to severe symptomatic distress or impairment in functioning due to psychiatric symptoms in at least one area of functioning, such as self-care, occupational, school, or social function. So in this um, situation, you know, it's not, if a student is really struggling and having um, struggles with PTSD or depression or anxiety, they generally will have some struggles with taking care of themselves, which can be not sleeping enough, sleeping too much, uh, not eating enough, eating too much, um, not being able to get to school on time, missing a lot of their classes, uh, not attending a lot of their classes. Socially, it can look like not having any real um, good friends, nobody they feel connected to. And so these are all things that the clinician needs to be mindful of documenting in the chart. And like I said, telling the story of how the diagnosis is really impacting the student's overall well-being. And so that's what pairs are looking for. How is the diagnosis impacting the student's well-being and ability to uh, function? Um, and then you also want to document that the student has the capacity to make progress towards treatment um, goals and or and or that the, the treatment is required to maintain or get back to a baseline level of functioning. And so this is just ensuring that, um, that a therapy is the appropriate uh, treatment for the, for the student. Um, and that you also wanna document the member does not require a more intensive level of treatment. Um, and so that they are, able to um, function at a moderate enough level, but that there are some impairments. Um, not that they are at immediate risk of harm to themselves or something like that, where they would need a more higher level of care. So we always do risk and safety assessments and that's documented every time you see them. Um, and so that is the medical necessity. Um, and yeah, I think it's just helpful to remember and think about it as a way of telling the story of how what the student is experiencing is impacting their day-to-day -day life um, and why treatment is beneficial. And there is some exemption, uh, exclusionary criteria, um, and, and this is um, something that advocates are really working on. Um, so the exclusionary criteria currently is that the primary problem is the social is social, occupational, or economic, um, or one of physical health without a concurrent psychiatric episode meeting criteria for this level of care, um, or and or the, it is not okay to use uh, this therapy as an um, alternative to incarceration. Um, and so right now there is actually some movement in the field where family therapy um, is covered as a treatment for a uh, social determinant of health and um, so I'm and I don't fully understand that uh, yet I think it's new and coming out um, so that's something to be on the lookout for that family therapy is um, actually going to be more available and covered um, and I think Tracy may be able to speak a little bit to that at the end um, and the other exclusionary criteria is that the treatment plan um, needs to be designed to address the goals of the active symptoms that the client is experiencing that go along with their diagnosis. Um, so for example, self-actualization is not something that a payer is interested in uh, continuing to pay for uh, therapy for. They wanna really see that what you're working on in therapy is to alleviate the symptoms that are getting in the way of the student's daily life. Um, and the, so the next part um, is to talk about for me, uh, how the diagnosis impacts the functioning. So this is something that the um, clinician needs to have documented um, in the assessment. A lot of EHRs um, make this pretty easy by having it in the, um, putting this in the diagnostic formulation at the end of um, this biopsychosocial assessment is where you can find this. Um, but it's really, you wanna make a clear picture of how the client and student is being impacted by their mental health concerns. Um, and so this is an example template of how to write a diagnostic formulation. And I highly recommend um, for anybody who wants more support on this, um, Stan Tobman from the Berkeley um, Training Associates has written a treatment planning guide. Um, and in there, he talks all about how to do the um, diagnostic formulation and how to create treatment plans that 
uh, justify all of the payers um, requests. So this is taken from the Berkeley Training Associates uh, book on the treatment planning guide. Um, and so this is just a generic uh, formula that anybody could use. So you really want to start out with the client's strengths and available resources. Um, and then you say due to the specific diagnosis that you have determined the client is struggling with, the client experiences, and you want to talk about the symptoms that the client has experienced that are related to the diagnosis, and then which lead to um, what the client, um, the, the impacts on the functioning and, uh, and how it um, is impacting their goals in their life. Um, and so just a simple example of this one uh, and is uh, for somebody who's experiencing general anxiety. Um, and it's, you know, the client starting out with their strengths, they value physical activity, um, knowledgeable about their health and, and nutrition. Um, and then due to generalized anxiety ex disorder, the client experiences generalized anxiety as evidenced by so I listed out the um, diagnosis and then the symptoms that they experience, pervasive worry, apprehensive anticipation of the future events, restlessness, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbance. So we're painting the picture of what the client is experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis and then how it's impacting them. As a result, their concentration and, and, and ability to complete and turn in homework and other duties at home are impaired due to hypervigilance and preoccupation with apprehensive anticipation, threatened with removal from the basketball team and failing grades due to impaired productivity. The client says he's unable to stop worrying and says it is hard to make decisions. So I think um, it can be intimidating to think about um, justifying medical necessity and things like that for payers, uh, but it can be helpful to remember that we're just painting the story of what um, the client is experiencing and how their mental health struggles are making things challenging for them. And then in the treatment plan, it's uh, important to document that uh, the goals and the objectives that we're working on are related to the functional impairments that we described in the diagnostic formulation. So it's just really that it's all connected and uh, telling the same story. Uh, it's also very important to make sure that the client is completely involved and bought into the treatment plan, right? It's their treatment, it's, it's their goals that they're working towards. Clients don't always have the wording or, you know, don't come with, these are the goals that I'm working on, but they know how they want their lives to be better and how they want to feel better. And as clinicians, it's our job to translate that into these, um, the, the forms that the payers are going to accept. And so uh, payers are really wanting um, goals related to functional impairments. They also want objectives. You know, we've all heard of SMART goals that are observable and measurable, related to a time frame, and related to a sense of um, progression. And so um, for an example for the last diagnostic formulation, um, I said uh, one objective could be client is able to identify two thoughts that increase anxiety within four weeks as measured by client report. Um, so we're really just helping everything tie together and showing the payer that everything we're doing is connected and um, in service of the client and that, you know, the overall client goal here is to be able to stop worrying and to be able to continue playing basketball and um, get his grades up. And two resources for treatment plans that I recommend. I mentioned the Berkeley um, Training Associates Treatment Planning Guide. And then I also recommend the Adolescent Psychotherapy Treatment Planner. Um, these uh, books are really helpful and give examples of um, objectives and goals and um, are written in a, in a way that payers uh, agree with. And so it can be helpful to have some examples of things as um, clinicians, you know, we're trying to do all of these, all of these treatment plans and so much on your plate and having some examples already laid out that you can pull from and then, you know, getting client feedback like, hey, is this something it sounds like you would want to work on? Does that feel doable? Um, but, and that we're really getting client involvement in the treatment plans. 
Another thing I want to say about treatment plans is that they're really a living, breathing document. It's not that the client comes in, we do the treatment plan, that's it. We know we're working with real people. Things change for them. Goals change, situations change, context changes. And so the treatment plan is really something that is meant to be evolving as the treatment progresses. You know, clients can come in with one thing and then a couple of weeks later, there can be a crisis that happens and maybe the treatment goal is adjusted to stabilization or um, maybe things start to feel better right away and maybe they don't need to be coming in every week. I mean, so many different things can happen and it's really important that clients are really involved in what their treatment plan is and that it's evolving with the uh, treatment. going to move on to minor consent. So can a minor consent to their own uh, mental health treatment? In California, we actually have two laws um, regarding minors and mental health. The first uh, one listed here is Family Code 6924 and Health and Safety Code 124260. And this law says minors ages 12 and over are eligible to consent to their own mental health care if they are mature enough to participate intelligently in their own care. So if, a minor, if the clinician deems that the minor is intelligent and mature enough to participate in their own care, 12 years and older, they are able to. There's another law, an older law in California that says um, a minor who meets all of the following requirements to consent for mental health outpatient care, that they have to be 12 and older, they have to be mature enough to participate intelligently, and the minor would be in danger of serious physical or mental harm to him or herself or others without treatment, or the minor is the alleged victim of incest or child abuse. So there is a more restrictive law about who can consent to their own mental health treatment. And as Katie was talking about the uh, payer minor consent medical for mental health, that funding stream uses the more restrictive law for minors to consent to their own treatment. Now it's determined by each county which law that they are going to use. And so we are actively advocating that um, counties use the less restrictive, less restrictive law. Um, but as of right now, many counties use the more restrictive law. So minors, in order to be eligible to use the minor consent medical paying funder, uh, the clinician must determine that the child is at risk of causing serious physical or mental harm to themselves or another without treatment, or they've been alleged, an alleged victim of child abuse or incest. And this must be documented in the client's chart, and the clinician must sign a letter that indicates the client meets this criteria. And this is the letter that Katie was talking about gets submitted um, with the application for the minor consent um, paying stream. And as Katie was talking about, what if a student does not qualify for any insurances that are accepted by um, the health clinic? So at Native American, they have uh, put into place a protocol because you know, a kid will be referred from say cost or a really concerned person and then the student comes in and they either have Kaiser and it's really difficult for them to access um, care or they don't qualify for any of the insurances, but they've come in and they've got this, they've had this assessment and they're struggling. So, and Native American has the um, protocol that they will give the student four sessions of counseling um, and then connected with others, connect them with other sources of support, peer support groups, mentor, um, whatever is available at that the site that the um, the student is at. Um, but those four sessions are paid for by the clinic's budget, and there is not a funding stream to pay for them, and so it doesn't allow them to see the student for more than that. Um, so we really recommend that if you are um, getting kids in and you are going to be considering using minor consent medical, they may not qualify. And so then it's important to have a protocol for what you're going to do um, if they do not qualify. So some challenges for um, to using the minor consent medical payer is that, like we talked about, there are limitations to who gets served. Um, they use the more restrictive California law. Um, ideally, 
we see that mental health treatment um, is preventative and would um, you know, be put into place before someone's gonna be a harm uh, to the, themselves or others. And they don't need to wait for that to be occurring to qualify, but currently that is um, what needs to happen in a lot of places. Um, you know, and in many clinics, assessments are one or two meetings and uh, the eligibility criteria may not come to light in those one or two sessions. Um, thus restricting students from needed services, even if they do qualify. I mean, the information needed to show that they are eligible is very sensitive information. And as clinicians, we know students will come in and they may not be ready or able to talk about abuse that they've experienced or the fact that they are considering harming themselves until they've met with somebody a number of times and feel really comfortable. So that really sensitive information is challenging to get in just one 30 minute session or you know, if you have longer uh, assessments available at your clinic, but they're not um, paid in this, a lot of cases they're not being paid for. And so um, it, it's a barrier to kids getting services, even if they do qualify for the more restrictive um, criteria. And at risk of harm to self or others, this is subjective clinician de determination. Um, there, it's not clear what, it's not written, it's to very strict guidelines as to what that means. And this also means that mental health stigma can create real barriers um, for treatment. So, you know, as in, at Native, there are some sites where uh, Kaiser is a popular um, insurance or there are private um, insurances, and yet parents are not necessarily supportive of therapy and, and the student doesn't meet the restrictive criteria for minor consent, um, the minor consent payer. And so, the parents aren't going to be taking them to therapy outside of school, but there's no pay funding stream for them to um, get services in school. And there, there's a real gap there as to who can actually receive um, receive services. Um, and so that is the uh, end of that portion. Um, now I will be pulling up another slide. Unless there are any questions. Oh, I see there are some questions for uh, this section. One moment. Let me go back and look through. Um, okay. Just if Which you want, I can pull up your last slides while you look at the chat box. Thank you. That would be great. Mm -hmm. um, so I see one here. Which students would not be eligible for minor consent? Also, is parental consent just too difficult or how has your clinic tried to seek parental consent? Great, so um, thank you for bringing that up, Lisa. I realized I did not cover <laughs> parental consent. So yes, parent, I'll start first. Which students would not be eligible for minor consent? In order to be eligible for the minor consent pair model, the, student, the clinician has to determine that the student has um, experienced incest or abuse or that they are at risk of harming themselves or others. So any student that does not fall under that is not eligible for the minor consent mental health funding. Parental consent. So parental consent we uh, need to get for any of the other funding streams. So for uh, all of them, <laughs> any other funding stream, we need to have parental consent on file for a student to be able to access the services. Um, sometimes students uh, register at the beginning of the school year and uh, the parents sign consent that they can receive any of the services at the health center at that time. So when that happens, um, parental consent is already um, done. And then the clinician, it's best practice that the clinician then gets parental consent for the specific mental health treatment and gets the parent, parent involved in the treatment plan and that they sign on to that. Uh, sometimes a student is referred for services and the parent has not filled out the um, parental consent at the beginning of the school year and they're not an enrolled student in the clinic. And so then, yes, the uh, clinician and the program coordinator work together to get parental consent before the student is able to access mental health treatment. Katie, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um... If it happens later on in the school year and we need uh, parent consent, we'll send it home with the student. Uh, sometimes what happens is that during that meeting with the behavioral health clinician to assess, uh, the behavioral health clinician will often call the parent uh, if the student feels like that is a viable thing to do. They'll sit with the student, call the parent, they will get verbal consent. 
and they will go ahead and document that in the EHR. So that's another, that's just an initial sometimes that happens. Yes. Um, and hold on, I'm going to stop my, sh oh, I think, uh, so, and another question is, are there limitations on what mental health services can be billed with parental consent as with minor consent limitations on that? Hmm. Uh, mental health service, so if at school-based clinics, we're doing individual therapy and assessment, and so that, and that can be the 45 minute, the 30 minute, 60 minute um, sessions. Um, if there is parental consent, I don't believe there are limitations on what mental health services. Um, and then, so under minor consent, would you be able to justify excessive use of marijuana as serious physical or mental harm? And how would you integrate substance use treatment? Great question. So I don't believe that is uh, what they meant when they wrote excessive or at risk of physical or mental harm, um, excessive use of marijuana. But like I said, it is subject, subjective to the clinician. And so if the clinician is determining that, they document that in their chart and they can um, argue that. Uh, how, another thing to talk about is that substance use counseling is covered under minor consent. It's another um, one of the minor consent payer. It's another option. And so if a student is um, having excessive use of marijuana and needs substance use treatment, um, that qualifies for as one of the paying streams. So um, you can uh, use that. And there's another, if, so I hope that makes sense. There's another little box. So just as there's outpatient mental health, there's also one that says substance use. So you can um, use, it for, use it for substance use treatment, um, which, you know, many students, it, so it, minor, it is a paying source that can be used with a lot of um, students. And how are you defining serious mental or physical harm? talk about that as one of the challenges it is clinician determination um and so yes i think that they it's intended to be cutting oneself risk of um suicide um but you know mental or physical harm it's, it's a subjective um criteria are there any other questions i think i got the ones that I could see. Okay, then I will move on to the next portion. Um, and Tracy, do you want to just advance the slide since you have it up? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm just it slide on my end. Uh, yes, sorry, I'm just pulling it up on my end. Okay. Um, okay, great. So now we're going to talk a little bit um, about uh, school mental health in general and um, the importance of integration. So as school mental health uh, providers, it's a big job. You wear a lot of hats. And in order for um, school mental health services to be the very best that they can be. It's really important that the clinician is really integrated into the school-wide culture and climate. And so teachers, admin, staff, they see you as a partner in this work and they see you as a resource and somebody that they can go to and get support when they're, ha they're noticing struggles come up for students um, in their classroom and that you can um, provide um, social and emotional learning supports um, in a in a classroom-wide setting or school-wide uh, being able to provide um, training and support on how a school can be uh, more healing centered um, and so uh, really as much as a, a mental school mental health clinician can be a part of professional developments can be a part of uh, school meetings um, and just really integrated to the school-wide culture and climate the more um, the clinician is going to be seen as a resource and a way that they, um, a resource and, um, and a valued part of the um, community. Um, and on another level there, uh, many schools have a, a type of coordination of services team. 
Um, and so this is where different service providers uh, doing all different services for students are able to come together and meet. And to have the mental health providers as a part of that team is so vital because like we talked about, uh, mental health services are limited and uh, it's important that we're um, using multi-tiered systems of support. And sometimes a support is gonna be something that the whole school needs, a group of student needs, or just a few kids are. Um, really struggling with. And, and so, as a coordination of services team, you all get to meet together and see what sort of struggles are coming up for students and who and what service is going to be the best fit for the student. Um, sometimes it's individual therapy, sometimes it's group, sometimes it's mentoring, sometimes it's being part of a culturally um, specific group that's going to really speak to the client. Um, and so being a part of whatever sort of coordination of services teams, but where you are working with all of the other service providers at the school site to make sure that the correct services are being provided to the students, um, the better. And then as Ali talked about, um, as much as possible doing integrated behavioral health. And that's complicated when there are different um, agencies providing medical and behavioral health at the site, different behavioral health providers. Um, and as much as possible, coming together uh, so that there are shared referral um, pathways um, and that medical providers and behavioral health providers are really working as a team to provide the best um, services to the students and and it can be really important to set up regular meetings if it's not possible every week bi-weekly monthly where medical providers and behavioral health providers are coming together um, to talk about what they're seeing and um, who can provide the uh, supportive services to the students um, and really be as integrated as possible. Um, it's so easy as mental health providers to get siloed um, but it, it you know because that's where our, our billable services are at in the the one-on-one -on -one services um, and so that's the challenge that all of these things we're talking about meeting on with other service providers providing supports to teachers and staff and admin and school-wide and classroom-wide supports, those things aren't billable and so they take away from the billable hours, but they're so important in um, providing mental health services on, on a school campus. Um, so uh, that's just, integration is very important. Uh, Tracy, I think we're ready for the next slide. Um, so another thing I um, wanted to talk about is the um, ACEs uh, screening. So this is, I just wanted to bring this up because we're talking about sustainability and funding. Many of you may know that uh, the ACEs, that eligible medical providers, and if you work in an FQHC, um, that they're eligible, <laughs> and you've taken the training and you've attested that you've taken the training, um, Medi-Cal is going to be reimbursing uh, $29 for um, conducting the ACEs screening. So in school-based um, services, we're, that's with children and adolescents. So I linked the PEARL screening tool um, on here, and that's the one that is approved right now through ACEs, the tool that they will um, uh, reimburse. Um, and uh, so I wanted to also bring this up that uh, we mentioned that there's advocacy around uh, medical nece necessity criteria um, changing and one of the things that there's advocacy around is that a high ACEs score um, will uh, determine eligibility for um, treatment. Um, so something to be keeping um, aware of. Uh, next slide. And in today's uh, world, uh, you know, doing ACEs via telehealth is something that is still, um, it, it can be done. Um, and these are, you need to make sure that you're documenting all of these things listed on here on in your charts. Um, and so, but it's really something to be thoughtful about whether it can be done in a clinically appropriate manner. And so at your clinics and your sites, that's something to really um, be thinking about. You know, we, the D, using the de-identified ACEs um, seems to be 
a great way to go. Um, but that's really hard to do via telehealth. And so it's really something to just keep thinking about how it's going to be done at your site. And uh, for any of you who really want to dive more into ACEs and whether you're going to do it at your site, how to do it well, we will be having a two hour session on this this afternoon from 12 to 2, where the first part will be on training. And then the um, second hour is really going to be talking to providers about challenges, limitations, successes, and how to do ACEs um, in the best way possible. How to screen for ACEs. Um, so anybody and all of you welcome to come to the next, to 12, from 12 to 2 where we talk about ACEs. Yes, thank you, Tracy. Next slide. Uh, and as we've talked about a little bit, telehealth, um, you know, has been a great way for FQHDs and school-based clinics to be able to continue to provide services and to provide billable services during this time. There is not no guarantee um, that it is going to continue, but there are advocates really working towards this. And um, because as we've all been able to see, telehealth decreases the no-show rates. It allows for providers to be more flexible in how they meet the needs of the students. Um, you know, a lot of clients are actually reporting that they prefer telehealth. We don't have to depend on a student being in their seat in their classroom where they're supposed to be at the time of their appointment, but we can make their appointment even if they're not even at school. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to telehealth and we're really pushing that it gets um, something that we're able to continue using even after the um, emergency uh, criteria has been put in. Uh, next slide. And that is all for me. Thank you everybody so much for joining today. Um, please, if you have any questions, type them in the chat um, and we will get to them as best we can. Um, I, we really appreciate all of you staying on with us. Um, yeah, um, I wanted to say a few things too, Jessica. Yes, that's all right. Please, um, yes. So first of all, thank you so much to the speakers this morning. Um, a very talented and experienced group, so we're so grateful. And I especially want to thank Jessica, who took on multiple roles at the last minute, is toggling between being a presenter and a moderator, which is quite tricky because there's multiple platforms working in the background, and who was receiving erroneous messages from me at the same time. So that's my personal apology, and I'm sorry also for some noise and other technical difficulties that were really human difficulties um, that were So deep breath again, as several of our presenters stated, um, I think this was a lot of information to pack into um, a fairly tight session and it covered a lot of different aspects of school, uh, funding school-based behavioral health services. So, um, you know, we acknowledge that this is a lot. I think really we could make this more of almost a full day for with breakouts and different groups um, and practicing. So that's something that we're gonna take under consideration and welcome your suggestions. And also, as you can see, there's a lot of room for important advocacy to help ensure that children and youth can get access to behavioral health services through their schools that are gonna keep them from escalating into a higher level of need, which is really, I think, what everybody wants right now. So having said all that, we have some time. We have actually about 15 minutes for questions. So um, hopefully you're madly typing, typing them in and Jessica's going to um, read them and pick someone to respond. So there's a question from uh, about the substance use. Can school-based clinicians utilize the substance use treatment option for minor consent Medi-Cal or would this be more for a specific substance use treatment program? Um, and so my understanding is if the clinician has documented that substance use is part of what they are treating. And it's, again, it, in the whole story, it's one of the diagnoses and it's in the treatment plan along with a mental health diagnosis, so it needs to be co-occurring. Yes, the um, substance use treatment option for minor consent medical can be used in school-based health clinics. I would again, like to add that. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was going to say, again, again, on that note, um, if you're going to be using that option, that definitely you want to bring that to the liaison's attention as well, as there could be another change in the aid code. Um, it just, it really depends. So you just want to make sure that that is added to their case. And there's another question that so, uh, so mental health providers can use the ACEs screenings despite using um, the CANs. And so, um, and when I says despite using the cans, I'm not sure. I think you still need to use the cans, but the ACEs screening that can be is something that can be used in 
addition to that to get the uh, reimbursement for it. Yeah, and Jessica, I just wanted to add one thing about the ACEs screening, if you don't mind. Um, Please. So mental health providers are eligible um, to screen and then bill a supplemental payment. If you're a mental health provider within an FQHC, you have to be one of those licensed provider types. So a psychologist, um, uh, an LCSW, or a LMFT if your um, scope has MFTs in it. So small caveat there. Thank you. And Tracy, did you have something you wanted to add earlier? I was only going to add that um, uh, CSHA is very interested in trying to bring greater clarity around the minor consent medical program, including areas like substance use treatment. So we are working with other allies and partners and with the Department of Healthcare Services at the state. So we hope that we're going to bring you additional um, information about this program in the next several months. And um, someone has a, a question. Um, maybe, I'm not sure. Cans, I cannot remember. Child, it's, it's, a, it, it's a screener. Um, so, it's, so what does the CAN stand for? And I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it is a screener that um, assesses, that clinicians use to assess child's um, strengths and needs. Um, it might be a child assessment of needs and strengths. I don't remember what it stands for. I'm sorry. Child and adolescent needs and strengths. Okay, um, needs and screener. strengths. And actually, I was going to suggest to maybe Jessica, if you're able to put in the chat the resources that you shared for um, treatment planning from Stan Taubman and the other one. Um, yes. Just to give you one more job today. No problem. And thank you, Lisa. She just typed in the child and adolescent needs and strengths. We still have up to 12 minutes available in this room. So if you have any other questions, please let us know. There is a question um, in regards to billing. I thought I saw somewhere that LPCCs could be included along with MFTs. And I think Ali. So, yeah, I can take that and, and Emily um, back me up if I start to stray off course. But within FQHCs, LPCCs are not a billable provider and they are um, not, so you cannot include them within your. PPS rate. Is that? Okay. Yeah, that, that my understanding as well. Yep. Okay. So there, ha there has to be LCSW, LMFT, or a licensed psychologist. Yes. Okay. Um, and another question. So you have to be a licensed mental health provider to do the ACEs screening. So that's for the reimbursement. Um, so in order to for Medi-Cal to reimburse the screening, which they also only reimburse one per child per year um, per clinic. So if a medical provider has done the ACEs screening and then uh, you decide to do it because you know the medical provider did it in your clinic, they're not going to reimburse both the behavioral health provider and the medical provider for doing it. Um, but yes, for the to be reimbursed for doing the screening, it has to be a licensed mental health provider. And I'll add Jessica. If you want, oh yeah. There are um, some health centers that have created, you know, workflows that work for their environment. So it may be that, uh, you know, it's a combo screening. Perhaps uh, a nurse on the primary care side would uh, introduce the screening to the patient, <clears throat> excuse me, walk them through some of the questions that they may have, you know, sort of give a cursory review of the screening results. But then ultimately, that screener has to be reviewed and the claim has to be, the supplemental payment claim has to be submitted by a licensed billable provider within an FQHC. And that's just with the FQHC. I would say, you know, there's other 
scenarios for, for other billable providers in non-FQHC settings, but within the FQHC, it has to be a licensed billable provider actually submitting mm -hmm. the claim. Mm -hmm. If there are any other questions, feel free to chat them. But I don't see any coming in right now. So I, I actually have a question <laughs> about the, uh, the billing um, for, so if a provider or like a, a nurse practitioner or maybe not a nurse practitioner, but like an MA does the screening for ACEs and we need a licensed um, mental health provider, if the school-based health center is like ours and attached to a main clinic, could that assessment be done and then transferred over um, to the clinic licensed mental health person and they could submit the claim as long mm. as they reviewed it that's quite the question and a, a pretty that's a that's a really interesting scenario i would have to ask the state about that scenario specifically the other key caveat to the um person who actually submits the claim is that they must have taken the two hour mandatory aces aware um, provider training, which anybody can take. I took it. I'm a non-clinician. Um, and then the clinicians have to attest with the state that they have taken that training. And that attestation piece is like your pass go, you know, collect your $29 or whatever it is. Um, and the folks that are going to attest are going to be licensed providers with an NPI number, right? Um, I scenario in your scenario I would say one of the key components is that somebody must have reviewed the the screening results and have enough competency and training and capacity to respond with the patient for positive mm -hmm. screeners right so for those positive areas um, I mean that's just like the basic clinical standard that you want to have right in your workflow and then in terms of the billing, I would have to ask the state if that's an allowable um, method. I would, I, I'm hesitant to offer a, an actual response for the billing piece. And there was a question that asked, can you talk about reimbursement for screening? And I think you just talked about that. Um, but yes, yeah, so the yeah. licensed provider has to take the training be, and attest that they have to have taken the training um, and then they can submit the claim. Um, and it says, and it also says, is ACEs the way to, I'm not sure, is ACEs the way to do this? It talks about prior to diagnosis and establish of medical necessity. So I think ACEs is one piece of a, an overall assessment and could be um, a part of establishing medical necessity. And I think that is what is one thing that um, there are advocates in um, that are trying to say that, yes, uh, you just need to have a high enough ACEs score. I believe it's three, but I'm not, don't, I'm not positive. Um, and then that should be enough to qualify um, as uh, meeting medical necessity criteria. Um, And I would say for the billing piece too, the Department of Healthcare Services has, re so it's a little wonky to do the billing for FQHCs um, because it's not your PPS rate and the state's like, I don't know how to receive a claim that's not an actual PPS rate. So we had to work with them um, to, to figure out what that system looks like. And there is some guidance on the Department of Healthcare Services website, um, specifically for FQHCs, what the claim should look like where you put the information, et cetera, um, and the codes and things like that. Um, and then I also wanted to add too that, you know, we're talking about the screening, but really one of the most important and critical pieces is to have the right environment to do the screening, right? Especially in this environment where we have, you know, uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 and structural racism embedded into our systems. I mean, we want to make sure that we're not bringing up a, a bunch of and, and bringing to light a bunch of issues without having the appropriate responses for patients. 
um, and having a trauma-informed and resilience-oriented lens. And mm -hmm. so I highly encourage you to take the, or to attend the session with Lior wolf um, who is one of my new favorite people. She's been doing a trauma-informed and resilience-oriented health centers seminar series, which is uh, taking place right now. They're nine minutes in of their like fourth session for CPCA. Um, so she's been leading that. She's presenting at this conference today. So I really want to plug that session. And then also check out the CPCA website. Um, and we have some, some great resources there. You're more than welcome to watch some of the recordings that she has completed um, for this seminar series, which is really all about like creating a healing environment, which will enable you to then screen in a safe way um, for your patients and for your staff, right? Because our staff, some of, some of our staff come from the community. I think in one session, uh, behavioral health provider was like, just because I'm a behaviorist doesn't mean I'm inoculated from, from trauma or from having anxiety um, as it relates to the pandemic or other things happening. So uh, really just really want to plug and encourage folks to make sure you're focusing on those systems of care um, that really support trauma screenings. Yeah, and if, to just piggyback on that, that is what we will be discussing um, this afternoon um, from 12 to two, uh, and really talking about all of the concerns that um, people have around um, administering an ACEs screen um, and what it, what it takes to do it in an ethically um, client-centered way that's actually um, healing and not um, just bringing up um, triggers. Um, and, and we're also going, so we're going to have the training today and listening session um, where we're talking about what are people's challenges around this? How do you do this in a good way? Um, and then we're going to be um, selecting from people who apply eight um, sites where they actually want to do implementing um, the ACEs screener in the next year. And we're going to meet monthly um, throughout the next year and talk about how is it going? What are you facing um, as challenges? And how can we um, support doing this in the best way possible, as Ali talked about, to be trauma-informed and healing-centered um, and that the whole system is supporting um, the students um, in that way. Um, so anybody who's interested in really diving very deep into ACEs and how to do it well, please join us this afternoon and then consider um, if you want to be a part of our learning collaborative throughout this next year. I'm inclined to stop there so that folks can get to the 1115 brain break, which um, I'm not looking at the program, but I know we have a great break for you coming up. So if there's nothing else burning in the Q&A or chat, Jessica, we'll call it a wrap. Thank you everyone for coming. We're so glad that you are working on this difficult um, and so important um, set of services for our youth. And thank you very much to the presenters. Take yes, care everyone. Thank you.